Good morning, and welcome to our third lesson on the book of First Peter. We're so excited that you're watching us this morning. Thanks for inviting us into your home. Uh, we're talking about finding your way in a whatever world, and we certainly are enjoying our study in First Peter. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that this coming Wednesday evening, Eli Hurt will be bringing our lesson on Wednesday evening, and we look forward to him bringing our lesson, and uh, so we invite you to come and, and to be with us this Wednesday evening. Also, beginning October the 14th, Stephen Kirby is going to be bringing a series of lessons titled Lost and Found. We're excited about that. It's talking about losing the bad and finding the good. So that will begin on October 14th and will last for several weeks. And then also this coming, uh, a week from this coming Sunday, um, our Sunday school class will be live, so we invite you to come back. We won't be recording that class, we'll be offering it live. We're also going to have Sunday school available for uh, our children, we'll, we'll we're going live that Sunday, so we're really excited about that, and so we invite you to come and be a part of that. So if you have your Bible this morning, turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to look at the first 12 verses there. 1 Peter 3. On May 8th, the year 2000, a virus spread throughout the world. Now, it wasn't a physical sickness. It was an internet virus. And when email documents were opened, it instantly affected every single address in your email account. It traveled from Asia to Europe and to America in the span of about four hours. It, e it even shut down Parliament. And in America, many major corporations were virtually shut down for the day. Why would thousands of Americans, why would people all over the world open an email address from, from an address they weren't really acquainted with? Well, it was very simple, really. In its subject line, it had the title, love letter and no one could resist opening something that said love letter so the love letter virus spread across the globe like a wildfire because everybody wants to be loved jesus said that subject line in every christian's life ought to be love in john chapter 13 verse 35 he said the world would know that we are we are his disciples by how we love one another Love is the very first fruit of the Spirit mentioned in Galatians chapter 5. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul reminds us that we can do a lot of great things. We have love. And we can put together inspiring services here. We can run creative programs like Sunshine Street or Youth Focus. But if this church isn't known first as a church where people love, then everything else is meaningless. But if we live our lives as a love letter from God, the church would spread like wildfire, like that virus did in the year 2000. And so when Peter writes 1 Peter chapter 3, he is challenging us to be a people who are marked by love in three different areas. The first area is what should love look like in a marriage what does love look like in an everyday life in marriage well peter will he will answer that question for wives first and then he's going to talk to the husbands and and ladies be before we get started here I, um, when we look at these verses you may have already noticed that Peter talks about the wife for about six verses and the husband for one verse. And, and before you say, well, that's not fair, 
Uh, let's, let's look at several observations. William Barclay reminds us that back in this culture, the wife's position was far more difficult than that of the husband. If a husband became a Christian, he would automatically bring his wife with him to the church, and there would be no problem. But if a, but if a wife become a Christian while her husband did not, she was taking a step which was unprecedented and might produce some incredible tension. In the ancient world, women didn't have many rights. Her husband owned her. So for a wife to change her religion while her husband did not was really unthinkable. And even though there's only one verse that's written to the husbands, I, I think it's important for us to realize that it was revolutionary for Peter to write anything at all. And for him to write one verse here was so important. Other moralists and philosophers of the day would teach about proper family conduct, but they would only address the inferior members of the household. They would talk about the wives, the children, the slaves, but they didn't talk much about husbands. In the New Testament, masters and parents and husbands are all addressed as well because the gospel had implications for their, for their conduct. But in the Greek civilization, the duty of the woman was to remain indoors and to be obedient to the husband. And there might be another reason why there's only one verse for men and several verses for women is because, well, let's face it, guys, women can handle more information than we can. And uh, maybe <laughs> the reason husband only gets one verse is because Peter knows he's talking to guys, and so he better talk slow and he better keep it brief and you better use short words so that we can comprehend this. I, I don't know. Just sort of being funny. But first of all, let's talk about the wives. Look at 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Wives, in the same way, be submissive to your husband, so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words of the behavior of their wives, and when they see the purity and the reverence of your lives. You know, this is one of these passages of Scripture that we like to conveniently skip over from time to time. But we really miss out on a lot of teaching of God's Word here. Now, last week, our lesson pertained about being submissive to government officials, being submissive to masters, being submissive to bosses. But here, Peter continues this theme of, of submission, and now he focuses on wives being submissive to their husbands. It's kind of unique, really. And in Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about this, but in the context of that chapter, uh, it's, it's talking to Christian marriages. But here, in this setting, in 1 Peter 3, it's talking about more when a wife is a Christian and the husband is not. And he tells us that the most effective method for winning them to the Lord is the life that they lead. So, Let's try to understand the life that he's trying to describe here. And let's begin by saying what submission doesn't mean. It's not a sign of, in, of an inferiority or weakness. It's not keeping all of your opinions to yourself and being the silent partner. What it does mean to you ladies is that in the decisions in your marriage, after explaining your position, reasoning with your husband, and trying to get him to see things from your perspective, you ultimately yield to his leadership. Now, hopefully, men, hopefully he's a smart husband. Hopefully he will seek wise counsel from you and will change his mind from time to time on things. The way I look at this sometimes is sort of like a pilot or a commanding officer, or a quarterback on a team. He may not be the smartest person, but he's still the person that has to make the call at the end of the day. So let's respect that. 
And it's almost impossible for us to realize what life must have been back in the day that Peter wrote about this. How hard it must have been in Greek civilization for the wife to be brave enough to become a Christian. So what then is Peter's advice? What does he offer here? Well, the thing he doesn't tell us to do, he doesn't suggest leaving your husband or deserting him. Instead, he encourages her to submit to him. Now, this does not mean spineless submission, but rather it's a voluntary selflessness. It's a submission not done out of fear, but out of perfect love. Of course, the Bible teaches that if the husband asks the wife to do something that is sin or unethical or immoral, she's not to submit to his request. And you don't have to submit yourselves to physical or mental or psychological or sexual abuse. And it doesn't mean that you can't express your feelings within a marriage. The Bible's quite queer, uh, clear. The Bible is quite clear that there's a higher authority. In Acts chapter 5, verse 29, it says, We must obey God rather than man. But it doesn't have to be that extreme. Peter's not saying to the wife that she's a doormat and her husband allows her to walk all over him. and Not at all. You have an opportunity, if you have an unbelieving husband, to do the things through your loveliness to somehow grasp his heart. And if your unbelieving husband's doing some things that will have a negative impact on himself, you or the family, your job is to lovingly share with him. So don't belittle him and don't berate him. And remember that no man was ever nagged into the kingdom of heaven. The premise of Peter's teaching to Christian wives is simply this. Although you may be more spiritual, and although you might have a deeper walk with Christ, if within your marriage you've asserted yourself and stand in a morally superior position over your unbelieving husband, then you are essentially standing between him and God. And God can't get to him. So when the woman allows God's plan to work and allows God to get to him, then he might say to you, please step aside and let me take care of him. You see, a man can take from God sometimes what he can't take from his wife. So let's be very careful. Chuck Swindoll suggests that this passage has four key words for ladies. The first is action. Verse 1 says that wives should win their husbands over by their behavior. Now that's not talking about a form of submission. It's talking about their overall life. It's talking about their prayer life. It's talking about their love. It's talking about their encouragement. And the second word it talks about is adornment. Watch your adornment. It's okay to look your best, but make sure you're dressing your best for your husband. Look your best for him. Make sure that's your top priority, not for somebody else, but for him. Look at what Peter says in chapter 3, verses 3 through 4. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment such as braided hair or the wearing of gold jewelry and fine clothes. Instead, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is great worth in God's sight. So make sure you're working on the outside is equally to working on the inside. The third word is attitude. Peter says... A gentle, quiet spirit. I like what the message says here. It says, what matters is not your outer appearance, the styling of your hair, the jewelry you wear, or the cut of your clothes. What matters is your inner disposition. 
And Peter even reminds us of some biblical examples and suggests uh, that Sarah, the wife of Abraham, is the one we should look at. Look at verse 5 and 6. For this is the way the holy women of the past, who put their hope in God, used to make themselves beautiful. They were submissive to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called her master. You are her daughters if you do what is right, and do not give away to fear. And then, attention. Sarah gave Abraham her attention. Sarah gave Abraham her energy. And she followed her husband as he sensed he was being led by God. Can, can you imagine your husband coming home to you and saying, you know, honey, uh, we're, we're going to leave the comforts of our home and we're going to travel for a while because God said to do so and we're going to live in a tent. I can't imagine Janet giving in that quickly and say we're going to live in a what? A, a tent. But she did. She trusted her husband. She believed to him. She gave her attention, her energy to him. And as you recall in Scripture, there, there were a couple of times when, when Abraham, you know, things became fearful and, and they found themselves in compromising circumstances. But God acted twice on their behalf. And it was when he, <laughs> when Abraham actually became a poor leader of his house. But yet, um, he was the leader. So she called him master. And she's held up as a role model. So she did go everywhere he went. And she was convinced that he was following the leading of the Lord. So that submissive love was there. But in verse 7, we see where he turns the attention to husbands. To the husbands. Look at verse 7. Husbands. In the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives and treat them with respect as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life so that nothing will hinder your prayers. Now remember, for Peter to even give one verse of instruction for a husband at this particular time he wrote this was really countercultural. It was really tough. But notice what he said first. First he says, be considerate. Literally translated, it means to live in the knowledge of your wife. In other words, you should be involved with, take an interest in, become a student of your wife. What are the hopes and dreams of your wife? Think back to when you were dating. You, you could talk for hours. Uh, you could get on the phone and, and talk for the longest of time. And, um, you, you were hungry to find things out about her. And then somehow when the wedding ring gets on the finger, sometimes we don't pursue that relationship the way that we should. I, I know I need to do better in this area. Guys, we could all do better in this area when it comes to understanding our wives. Get involved with them. And I'm, not, I'm not talking about things that they are involved in, but I'm, I'm, I'm suggesting that we really try to find out about where their heart is. And that's not the easiest thing to do. But if we try, I think it'll pay huge dividends for us. The second thing he talks about doing is being respectful. Peter says to treat them respect as the weaker partner. And the, and the word conveys to treat them in a delicate fashion. And, and come on, guys. And we're not handling like a 64-ounce mug that we get at a convenience store. We're, we're, God has instructed and entrusted to us guys like a fragile piece of china. And, and so we take care of them and, and realize that they're more valuable than... And it is breakable. So, so ha handle your wife with care and with loving respect. And again, remember what, who Peter's writing to here and how hard that must have been for him to write this. Weakness isn't in inferiority. It's referring to the physical component. 
And husbands, may you never use your size or your strength or your voice as a weapon with your wife. That type of threatening behavior has no place in the life of a Christian man. That's why it goes on to say next, to be spiritual. You are to lead your wife. You're, it's your responsibility to lead your wife and your household spiritually. Now let her voice be heard. Let her know that you value her opinion. You know, Jesus elevated womanhood, and when you understand the culture and the times of which they were writing, you realize that Peter and Paul did also. They talk about being heirs. It says, as heirs with you, the gracious gift of life, so that nothing hinders your prayers. And understand that in that ancient culture, especially in the Jewish cultures, that there was a common Jewish prayer that was led and it would say Lord I thank you that you did not make me a slave a Gentile and a woman so it's in that setting that Peter writes these radical words as he elevates womanhood and he tells the guys to treat their wives with respect and back then that was unheard of so what was taking place here was revolutionary here in Christianity emerged this principle that women had equal rights, equal spiritual rights. And with that, the relationship between sexes has changed forever. That's why it says in Galatians chapter 3, verse 26 through 28, Paul writes, You are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you all are one in Christ Jesus. So husbands, take the lead, take the spiritual lead of your home. So then, let's look at two other areas that Peter talks about in this chapter. What does love look like in the church? Well, Peter tries to give us a, a glimpse of that. He says in verse 8, Finally, all of you live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers. Be compassionate and humble. Now, the first thing he talks about is unified love. It's tough to tell from the English translation that Peter is referring to how to act and love one another in, in respect to relationships with the church. But there's, there's one tip off here, and it's in one word in this verse, and it's the word brothers. Brothers. And every time you see that term, it's always used when it's talking about relationships within the church, within the body of Christ. So, brothers, we must have unified love. And then, sympathetic love. Peter says, be sympathetic. It literally means to feel with. It's not an exterior emotion or something that comes, it's something that comes from within. It's a sincere concern that you have for others, especially when they're going through hurt or pain. So, also within the church, we're, we're to have compassionate love. We're to have compassion for each other. And then, humble love. The church should be the model of humility in the way we relate and interact with others. The focus is placed on others and on Christ. And so we try to divert a spotlight that's on other areas and bring it back to being humble. And that, that type of love for the church is what Peter's talking about. And so then he goes into the final area of this chapter. What should love look like to the world? What should love look like to the world? Look at verse 9. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult, but with blessing, because to this you were called so that you may inherit a blessing. 
Now this reminds us of the Sermon on the Mount. And we're told to love our enemies. It also reminds us of Paul's words that we find in Romans chapter 12. As far as it is possible, live at peace with everyone. So what I like to, to point out in this small phrase is just refuse to retaliate. And that's tough for us. Um, we all remember major things that have happened, such as the event of 9-11. We want to retaliate. And we understand that it's the government's job to respond, to protect our country, to rightly respond with just force. And according to Romans chapter 13, we try to respect that decision. But the second appropriate response must be from the church. The church's response is to be different at times from that of the government's. And really, maybe it's not that hard to understand. You see, the government, at her best, can restrain evil. But when the church is at her best, she can help transform evil to good. You know, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, when he was being stoned to death, he prayed, he prayed for the people that were throwing rocks at him. So you see, we can transform evil into good. And then, seek to serve others. Look at verse 10, 1 Peter 3, verse 10. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceitful speech. He must turn from evil and do good. He must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are attentive to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So what does that say to us? It means that our response when we're treated poorly is to respond with love. Christ talks about this again on the Sermon on the Mount. If you only treat those people good who are good to you, then what have you done? Even the pagans do that, he says. That's why Christ talks about loving your enemies. And you see that concept of seeking, the concept of looking for those, seeking that out, it, it's very foreign to us. But we want the message of this sacrificial love to spread like wildfire. So we want it to spread in your marriage, we want it to spread in your church, and we want it to spread in this world. So that's lesson number three. Um, we look forward to seeing you uh, for worship at 1030. We hope you all have a blessed day.